um, like half the clients don't even know who I am from like that standpoint of like, you know, there's a book, there's a movie, he's a slow survivor. And it's not that I don't share about it, but it's like, is that what I want to lead with in life? Like, you know, uh, like I want him to know me more than that. It's a huge part of my life and it's massive. And you see people that find fame and take advantage of that. And it's like, I've become famous for something I don't want to be famous for, right? It's different if you save someone's life or you go through this heroic thing, but to be the, the one person that survived, like that's a race no one wants to win. Like you don't even want to start that marathon. And so for me, that's been important through this entire decade is like, Humility, you know, like my actions impact more than just myself. Their legacy, you know, their children, when they grow old enough and they can comprehend, like did Brennan waste his life or did he spend it worth living? That's a lot. Yeah, that is a lot. I don't take that pressure, but I'm aware of that. Yeah. Like it's not my job to please everyone. But in tune by living a good life and being a man of integrity, being a man like my brothers, then I get to hopefully make people proud. So that's that's my take, my two cents. Is that part of your purpose now? Yeah, 100%, yeah. Is to give back what I've been given and um, to, you know, help people. Like I suffered that tragedy and it was world news and you know, had so many opportunities to get help and so many people reaching out and I denied it and I denied it. And then when I finally wanted it, it was there for me and other people don't have that, yeah. you know? So that flip side. And then also back then when this happened, like PTSD wasn't a thing in the fire service. It was like, oh, that's for veterans. We don't have that here, you know? And um, that's evolved tremendously through the Tiger Act, through nonprofit, through fundraising, through understanding and even then it's still you know it's still not where it should be within first responders yeah. the level of acceptance and treatment around it is not you know up to par across the board now there's some departments police fire that do an amazing job though they do a phenomenal job taking care of their own but across the board we have to raise the bar what would you like to see done um I think there's plenty of options for treatment. I think more support in it. And so like, I think over the last few years, we've seen this amazing climb and conversations around PTSD, which has been fantastic. And I think it's, it's phenomenal how far they've come, but I think they've missed this gap within substance abuse and how that uh, co-occurs with PTSD. And so you look at like, Someone who suffers from addiction, 80% of those have, you know, trauma. That's statistics, right? It's psychology today. And so then you would think, you know, that's kind of relative to someone with PTSD. And so um, I think more awareness and more acceptance around it. And I, and I understand too, we have to have a certain level of accountability that we can't have, you know, members of our public service you know, drinking, using pills, substances, other things of that sort while under, you know, in the care of others, right? To the flip side, you know, um, you're not paying these people a million dollars a year, so it comes at a cost. So at some point in time, we have to take ownership of that. There's two parts, right? The ownership of like, you signed up to do this job and, you know, that's, that's a responsibility of your own, which, you know, all of us take that on. But to the flip side of like, what are we asking for, right? What is the, um, what is the cost that this comes at, right? And so, you know, I think just recently there was a firefighter in the Valley, there's, he has cancer and they're still trying to convince the city for benefits. Yeah. 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 Like, it's pretty wild. Like that shouldn't be an issue right, right. now. Right. Like, that shouldn't be a conversation. Like the conversation should be like the understaffing. Yeah. Yeah. The amount of overtime, what's that mentally taxing? And like you talked about going on calls of families, you know, and, and how does that impact them when they lose somebody? That's, that's the same thing with these men and women who are serving us. Mm -hmm. Police, fire, EMS, nurse, hospitals, right? We, 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 we asked so much of them through COVID. 
so much of them. And then we just, we just expect them to be fine. Like <laughs> while the rest of us, we're still suffering, but sitting yeah. on our couches, yeah. you know, and some really suffer losing their job, losing their homes and, and, and you know, really suffered through pain. We, we didn't take care of those two sets of people. And so you look at first responders, they showed up. Where did you find support after? Was it directly through the fire department? Was it you had to seek it out on your own? Yeah, it was directly in a roundabout way through the fire department. Yeah. Um, Carrie O'Mella, her husband's a Phoenix firefighter and she's a clinician. And so she was attached to this tragedy kind of from day one through the Hunter Club. And so we were at a memorial in Emmitsburg, Maryland and get done the, the memorial and this is year one probably, just shut off, very numb. And uh, we just had a, yeah, yeah, me, oh yeah, God, yeah. And you know, uh, tradition, you go to this bar and so I just do what I'm good at, I just start drinking and she comes over and strikes up a conversation and somehow talks me into going into counseling. And so that's kind of when the journey began and it was a slow drawn out process. Um, but as I started to face those issues of loss and grief and guilt and shame, and so many other things that had happened during that time frame that just like traumatic in itself. And uh, I just started to find healing. And like I thought for so long that that was not possible. Like the man, which I mean, I was 21 when that happened, child, young man, whatever you want to call it, uh, that I was, you know, July 1st, 2013, that was it. Like. That anxiety, that depression, the nightmares, PTSD, suicidal, like that was not going anywhere. Like there might be relief some days, but as far as like a freedom from it, that just didn't seem possible. So I just accepted that as my fate mm -hmm. for years, for four years. And then what changed in the fourth year? Um, sick of feeling that way? Or yeah, I mean, I gotta make a change. Yeah, Carrie having that conversation and going to counseling, and so I started doing trauma therapy and it really started to relieve a lot of those symptoms, EMDR therapy and Prescott. And it was phenomenal. It started lifting this weight off my shoulders, but I just didn't have total freedom. And my counselor was like, hey, do you want to talk about like your alcohol use? And I'm like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> you know, I was 20, 24, 25. You know, and I'm like, oh, all my friends drink. Like, what's yeah. my problem? Like, there's no booze in my house. I had every justification in the world, right? And it wasn't until I found myself in a Bible study full of men in recovery that had absolutely nothing, but had so much more than I ever had in that moment. You know, like I had the outside exterior, a nice truck, home, engaged, two kids, you know, all this stuff right but internally i was just dead on the inside and i go to this i sit in a living room the size of this 10 12 people and i hear these guys talk about getting into treatment and they barely had you know enough socks to get them through the week but they had a smile and joy in their face that i was i wanted mm -hmm. and money couldn't buy that mm -hmm. it was their ability to surrender and accept the fact that they were addicts alcoholics mm -hmm. it's just, just a new lifestyle and it and it and it just uh, it just hit me, yeah. and so through trauma therapy, through newfound faith and fellowship, I St. Patrick's Day, you know, of all days being Irish, and I was like, I'm done. Yeah. Like God, if you're real, then let's try today, and it worked. It's awesome. And then. And it's been six years. Yeah, and like. There's these cheesy sayings, you know, just for today, one day at a time. And you hear them and you're, you're just like kind of cringe, but it's like at the core of it, like it's so true. And I'm just here today. Yeah. Like I'm not promised tomorrow. So like, can I be sober today? Yeah. yeah. Can I love others? Yeah. You know? Does uh, being able to watch your kids grow help when you gotta be there for them? Yeah. You know, um, at first it was very difficult because I was so guilty of being here and being 
Like it, I'm getting to enjoy my kids yeah. and they're not here to see theirs grow. Yeah. Like yep. Yeah. So like for the first few years, like holidays were just non-existent, you know, like I'd try and celebrate for them, but I just wasn't present. Mm -hmm. Like birthdays, Christmas, first day of school, like those kind of, mm -hmm. I just felt guilty. Mm -hmm. Like I punished myself. And have you learned through counseling or whatever that that's a normal response to going through something like you went through? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, normal, yes. Proper, no, right? Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> we shouldn't punish ourselves, mm -hmm. right? But we, we, like we were talking about earlier, you talk about childhood stuff and like you learn things and you pick up on things. And four to seven, that's how you are for the rest of your life. And to change anything outside of that is pretty difficult, but obviously possible, right? This has come from people way smarter than me. And, you know, um, yeah, I learned that like, what I reacted with was what kept me alive. Mm -hmm. As negative as it was, as, as detrimental the drinking was for me, as my coping skills were so, you know, not appropriate, like they kept me alive. Mm -hmm. They didn't put me in a place of happy and peace, but it kept me here on earth. And so like as sick as it was, I had to recognize like what they did for me. Mm -hmm. Like I'm here today, Yeah. you know, like if I didn't drink, I, probably had killed myself I had to got there yeah. you know or ended up in prison or psych ward or you know DUI or something and so like the things that I did as unhealthy as they were they you know they, they served an unfortunate purpose right and so like the question of like did you learn how that that affected you and how that helped you in that moment or you know um, can look at it a few different ways. Yeah, yeah. Learned a lot about it. Yeah. And like some of our biggest, you know, assets can be some of our biggest defects too, right? You know, we all have that one friend that just like achieves everything. But like internally, they're just dying because it's never enough. Mm -hmm. That's like, man, if we can just have those kind of conversations with people of like, it's okay. Mm -hmm. 